hooping material, needles, thread, stabilizer, and pre-washing fabric. We're going over all that in today's video. Welcome to The Sewing Report. I'm Jen. This channel is all about sewing crafts and DIY projects, and I have been inundated with questions all about machine embroidery. So I wanted to do a video just for you. This is for beginners to embroidery machines. I've been doing a series with the Brother PE800, and I wanted to do a special episode just dedicated to some real basics, everything from hooping, what kind of thread I use, and also how do I choose the stabilizer, the needle, and the thread for different types of projects. So I know some of these questions are very specific, and I wanted to go through my process of kind of troubleshooting and figuring out what combination to use so that even if you're doing a project that I have not done, you can still use that same thought process to figure it out on your own. So let's get started. If you're brand new to embroidery machines, I would also recommend you check out a video I did on an overview of this specific machine, the Brother PE800. And the tips I'm going to share with you in this video are pretty universal, so you don't have to have the same embroider machine. First, because I've had so many of you asking what type of machine you recommend for beginners, this is my first embroider machine, and I'll be honest, I really like it. I've had this one for about two years. I haven't personally had any issues with it, and at first when I got it, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it, but I found so many ways to incorporate machine embroidery into my sewing and to other projects. It's been really great to have. I'm also a big fan of unitasker machines. I know there are some sewing embroidery combo machines out there. I'm not gonna be buying one of those. In the past, I did have a Brother SE400, which is kind of a, an entry level sewing machine slash embroider machine. The embroidery functions on that one were pretty limited and I found the stitch quality was not as good as the PE800. I really prefer to have different sewing machines for different tasks, even if they take up a little more room, I, that's just my preference. So for all of you asking what I think about such and such model and whatever model, if I haven't tried it, I really can't speak to it because I haven't used it. The only real embroider machine I have used is this one. So for all of you asking what machine I would recommend, I mean, obviously because I own and am using this one, clearly I am endorsing it in some way, even though I really don't have any affiliation with the brother company at all and they're not a sponsor. I bought this with my own money and I've really been liking the machine. Of course, I do actually recommend this. I think it's a great machine for someone who's just starting out. I don't think I would recommend this to someone who's hoping to do a business out of embroidery where you're doing tons and tons of items. But if you're a hobbyist or if maybe embroidery is something you do occasionally for customers, this might work. It is a single needle machine. So you do have to change out the thread every time you want to switch colors. With the more expensive multi-needle machines, that is a convenience, you don't have to change the thread, but the caveat is that you're gonna be paying a lot more money for one of those more commercial machines versus a domestic machine like this one. It does come with a five by seven hoop, and I've seen some embroidery enthusiasts say, buy the most expensive machine you can afford with the largest hoop because you might grow out of it. I found that to be largely true. I think the five by seven hoop size works pretty well for me. I don't do anything crazy. I did buy some extra hoops. I got some like off-brand hoops on Amazon that came with another five by seven hoop. It came with this four by four hoop. It also came with like a, a, like a weird size larger hoop that you could technically use, but you really couldn't do a design larger than the five by seven. And then it came with a very small hoop, I guess, if you want to do monograms. I mostly use the five by seven hoop for 95% of the projects. I might occasionally use the four by four for smaller things like monograms, but I found that the five by seven is my default hoop. I did put a few accessories on the hoops to make them a little easier to use. The very nice folks at Nancy's Notions a while back sent me a huge box full of embroidery stuff and I have been using a lot of it. They did send me some of these really comfy foam grips 
for the screws on the hoops. I have come to like those. On the 4x4 hoop, I did put a little bit of painter's tape on the inner hoop, and I read that was a good way to kind of keep your material from like slipping out of the hoop. It does seem to make a little bit of a difference. You can also use things like, I think I've seen bandages from the dollar store, so there's all kinds of stuff that you can do, like little things you can do to your hoops to make the material less likely to slide out. And again, I, I think these grips on the screws are a really good addition because it kind of keeps you from like, messing up your hands and fingers so that is also a benefit. Nancy's Notions also sent me this Thread Director 2 gadget and I put mine on the bobbin winder and I found that it's good for thread to not get tangled, especially for metallics or for anything that is more prone to thread breakage. I have found this thread director to be pretty handy because when you put thread on the regular holder, it can get twisted up. Okay, so let's go over the actual hooping process. I'm going to show you my ways of doing it. And just a disclaimer, if you're doing it a different way, that's totally okay. Do what works for you. All right, I've got a couple samples. This is just some scrap cotton flannel. And I'm going to show you a couple of different ways of hooping. Okay, the first, this is where whatever, you just need to get it on the fabric. It doesn't really matter where it is. I wanna cut a piece of stabilizer that is certainly larger than the hoop. So I'm going to use this piece of cutaway stabilizer. And I did a video a while back on what stabilizers I use. I've sort of updated the way I do things a little bit. I now use cutaway stabilizer a lot. This is probably my default stabilizer for many projects, especially if it's like a zipper pouch or something where you're certainly not going to see the backside. I also use this a lot for clothing, especially for things like dress shirts or anything that's like a woven fabric. The cutaway is probably my favorite at this point. It performs pretty well. I just get an off brand sometimes. Sometimes I also use Sulky. So you can try out different types and find what you like. To make things easy for me, I'm going to cut this lengthwise. It technically will fit if you have the width be the length, but it's a little tight. And I just wanna make sure I'm giving myself a very generous amount. And I will often use my rotary cutter to cut the stabilizer. It's real easy and quick. So I'm gonna loosen the screw on the outer hoop and then lay down my stabilizer and just make sure that it really fits in this area. Give it, give it some generous buffer zone on all sides. Now I'm just gonna lay my fabric over it, put the inner hoop over top, and then I'm going to push this down. Oh boy, sometimes it might be a little tough. Here we go, okay. This fabric is pretty thick and I will use my fingers to push down the corners. And my general rule of thumb is that I want the inner hoop to push out a little past the outer hoop. So it kind of looks like this. And then once I've got all four corners, it's gonna be kind of a tight squeeze on that last corner. I'm not gonna really need to tighten this at all. This is the very bare bones, basic way of hooping your material and stabilizer. And again, this is for if it really doesn't matter where on the fabric the design is stitched, like you're just playing around or you're going to be cutting out the material later to exactly cut your pattern piece or whatever else you're going to be making this into. For instance, I stitched out this applique pattern, the sewing report logo, and I just used a scrap piece of fabric. I just made sure that the fabric is big enough that when I cut it down to whatever size I want it later, that there is enough room. And I just sort of did this as a sample, but say I wanted to make like a zipper pouch, then I could kind of center, make a center point on the circle and then work from there and then figure out where I wanted to cut around it. So I would sort of say this is like fussy cutting fabric. You're just fussy cutting on the already stitched out applique. Now, if you're attempting to embroider anything that's thicker, say towels, I did a bath mat a while ago. That's something you're probably gonna want to float over the hoop rather than try to hoop inside these two hoops because it's gonna get really tricky and then you might leave burn marks. The hoops may leave permanent marks behind in that material. Like if you're doing obviously leather, velvet, anything that's kind of delicate. If you're trying to do like faux fur or something like that. So I have some previous videos on floating in the hoop. So the difference is that you would hoop just the stabilizer alone. I usually make 
guide marks on the stabilizer within the hoop. Then I will put painter's tape over the hoop so it doesn't get gunk on it. And then I will spray just the stabilizer in the hoop with temporary adhesive. And that's something that your material that you're floating over the top can stick onto temporarily. I find that method works really well. Usually over that, I will put a layer of water soluble topper and keep that in place with some basting pins. That is a system that has worked pretty well for me. Another thing I kind of picked up is that if you have a bulky item you're hooping like a sweatshirt or when I was doing that bath mat, sometimes during the embroidery process, you wanna keep that fabric or material from going all over the place. And I found that clamps for my photography backdrop worked really well for that purpose. So if you're looking for something to fulfill that need, I would highly recommend getting some of those clamps and then you don't have to babysit your project quite as much because you're keeping the other portions that you're not embroidering out of the way sufficiently. Okay, moving on to scenario number two. This is where you have a piece of fabric you've already cut out and you need to make sure that the design is centered on it. This would also work if you're doing like a piece of clothing like a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. You just need to mark out your lines and make sure that they are lined up with these little center marks in the hoop. So there's center marks on the top and bottom and then on both sides. Sometimes it really helps to fold the material in half like this and then take a marking pen. This one is great. It's a clover air soluble pen and it's air and water soluble, so the marks will disappear either after a couple days or if you get them wet. So either way works. I do have these in my Etsy shop and I love these things. I have a ton of them. I use it all the time for different projects. So to find the center point, I folded this piece in half and then I'm just gonna make a little mark at the center point here. And you can actually make the marks on either the right side of the fabric or the wrong side of the fabric because I'm gonna show you a trick for if you're floating the fabric. All right, and then we're gonna make these on the back side too. Another tool that really comes in handy is this flexible clear plastic ruler. This is used a lot in dressmaking, but I found it works really well for embroidery stuff. So I'm gonna use this to mark up my line and I'm just gonna draw a line across the center here. And then we'll also do it on the back and I'm gonna show you a couple different ways that you can line up your fabric in the hoop. And I'll show you in a few minutes why I'm marking both the back and the front. Now I'm gonna fold the piece on the vertical and do the same thing here. So now use this ruler and mark out your other line. Again, these marks will disappear, so don't be too scared. They're gonna go away. They're not gonna be there forever. All right. Unscrew the hoop again. If you're gonna be hooping the material in the hoop, all you have to do is try your best to kind of eyeball where the center is here. I'm going to place the inner hoop over the fabric and I'm gonna start moving it around so that it matches the center marks. I'm kind of moving the hoop around and the fabric together so that it lines up with the outer hoop here. Now see, it's gonna line up pretty well like this. So this is generally how I hoop fabric where I need to be precise that the center is the center. So you can see that the marks that I made on the fabric are lining up pretty well with the center marks in the hoop itself. Now I'm gonna show you one other scenario and that is if you are floating the fabric. So say, let's pretend this is like a towel or something really thick. In this situation, so I'm going to hoop the stabilizer by itself Tighten the screw as much as I can because you don't want this to come loose. And then those center marks, I'm actually just gonna draw on the stabilizer here. So this is where the flexible ruler comes in really handy. And it doesn't have to be super exact because when I start my embroidery design itself, I can move the needle around to make sure that the needle starting point also matches the center mark on the fabric. Now I have center lines marked out on the stabilizer. There are actually a couple ways I can accomplish this. If for some reason I need to keep this facing up, I will sometimes use a pin. So I'm gonna mark through the center. I would use this to line up the center and then I would continue to 
poke the pin through at various points of my center line and then continue to line that up like this until my piece is in place. Another thing you can do is you can fold the piece in half, fold it like this. You can take your hoop and line it up. This is obviously why I've made the marks on the wrong side. So you can mark the marks on the right side and then use the pin to help you line up all the center lines. Or you can mark your lines on the wrong side of the fabric and then use this. So see, I can line up the center lines and then unfold it. And then I can also kind of check at various points. So see, I can make sure that the line matches up and I can also do this on the other side and make sure that the line matches up. This is when you're floating material on the hoop. And the reason you float the material is so that you don't, the fabric is either too thick for the hoop or you don't wanna get burn marks in the hoop. Let's get more into stabilizer, needles, and thread, and kind of how they all work together. When I'm floating a project, especially if it's a fabric that has some nap or texture, like bath towels or anything that is not real like smooth across, I will typically put water soluble topper over it and that will help the stitching to kind of stay uniform and you won't get like little bits sticking out. That's what this stuff is for and water soluble means it will wash away so it is not permanent. So I did a video quite a while ago about stabilizer and for all the projects I've done when I've done videos standalone about various uh, scenarios like doing hats or doing towels, I kind of have shared my stabilizer combination. A lot of projects I'll at least put cutaway stabilizer under the fabric. If it's a fabric that's also kind of more delicate or you just wanna give it some extra stability, you can also use starch or use something like Terial Magic, which is a temporary fabric stiffener. You can use that to add some more temporary stabilization. But I find the cutaway stabilizer is a pretty good default stabilizer, especially if you're doing woven fabrics, like you're doing quilting cotton, say you're making a zipper pouch, this is a good option. You can also double up the layers if it's like a real dense design and a fabric that just needs a little extra stabilization. When I'm doing towels, I've been doing on the bottom wash away stabilizer. It's sort of like this stuff, but it is not clear and it's a little firmer. So I'll do that on the bottom, then I'll do the towel and, and, and I'll float the towel and then I will put a layer of water soluble topper. The reason I do this is because I don't really like anything that's gonna be visible from the back. I don't like when it looks kind of ugly. So I've been doing the wash away so that at least it gives it a cleaner finish and you don't have like bits of stabilizer on the back. No, the, both of those wash out. When I've been doing it to the towels, I haven't noticed any adverse effect from it as far as you know, it not being stable enough after you wash it, I find it still looks pretty okay. And at least on the back, it looks nicer in my opinion. And this works especially well on thicker towels or like the bath mat. It really does not need a lot of stabilization just because it's so thick already. I just did that temporarily just to get the design stitched out and then it washes away. So I found that to be a good combo for me. You might want to experiment a little bit with different scenarios. For knit fabrics, I find the no-show mesh stabilizer is a really good option. The no-show mesh stabilizer is a non-woven material. It's kind of soft, it's got good drapes, so it won't make your knit fabrics look really like stiff or crunchy. And it has like a tiny bit of stretch to it. So I found this to be a pretty good one for knit fabrics. I sometimes will hoop the knit fabrics, but if it's something thicker, like a sweatshirt, I would probably float that over the hoop. And I may do a future video on doing sweatshirts. So if you're into that, that's probably gonna be a video in the near future. So hopefully stay tuned. When I was first getting started with embroidery, I did use a lot of tearaway stabilizer and that's kind of not my favorite. I don't use it a lot anymore. You know, I like the cutaway because at least you still have quite a bit of stability after your project. So with cutaway, you hoop it, you stitch it, and then you cut away the parts. I like to do kind of gentle curves around the design. I think it keeps a nicer shape afterwards, and I think it looks a little bit neater than the tearaway. I, th I find that the designs I've done with tearaway, over time, I think the designs got a little bit warped, 
and that's it's just not my favorite stabilizer although I think for doing like practice chest stitch outs that sort of thing I think the tearaway is fine if it's something you don't really care about and you're just trying out new designs and you want to use up your tearaway stabilizer that's a good use for it now a lot of you have been like writing or DMing me I've gotten emails just saying hey I've got this specific scenario what needle stabilizer thread should I use? And that's really hard for me to answer because every situation is so different. And even if we're both using quilting cotton, it could be two different types of quilting cotton. So it's really hard for me to give such specific advice. So I wanted to just walk you through my thought process and just protocol I go through when I'm trying to make those determinations. So that hopefully helps you make those same decisions because I'm, I can't be there with you guys. And I mentioned this in the past, but I am not a sewing machine tech. So I'm really not very comfortable troubleshooting like issues with your machine or giving like very specific advice like that because again, I'm not there. And unfortunately I'm not able to do it. I hope this is helpful for you guys, but for all of you guys who send me like DMs on Instagram, I am sorry, but I cannot write back to you guys. So please don't do that anymore. If you have a very general question that is for a wider group of people, feel free to leave that in the comments and I may do that in a future video. But for all the people that are like writing me with stuff that just applies to you, unfortunately guys, I can't do that. And I'm not real comfortable with giving advice for a situation where I'm not present and where I don't exactly know all the factors. That's why I wanted to talk about all of the things I use. So as far as needles, I have used quite a few different needles. I've tried different things with different thread types and fabrics. And I mentioned this before, my general default needle that's in the embroidery machine is the Oregon Ballpoint 75 over 11 needles. I've used them on cottons, wovens, knits, and generally they work pretty well. If you're using a thread that's thicker or a metallic, you 100% wanna use a needle that's meant for metallics. This is a class 90 over 14 metallic. This was sent to me by Nancy's Notions. They also sent over some class embroidery needles. And I did not know this, but apparently embroidery needles all have like a little bit of a ballpoint. And that's so that it doesn't tear the material, that it kind of slips in between the fibers so that it doesn't destroy the fabric you're stitching on, which is cool. I will say metallic thread, no matter what you do and how many tricks you try to do to make it easier. It is going to be one of the more difficult threads to use. So keep that in mind. I did a video a while back on tips for working with metallics. And even with all of those things in place, like going slower and using the thread director too, it's still going to be a little bit tricky. I've recently tried some kind of like a uh, hybrid threads. They're like regular cotton or polyester thread, but it has like metallic fibers in it. I found that gave a really nice sheen to it and kind of some bling without the headache of just a straight up metallic thread. So I tried the uh, Sulky Polystar thread. That's a good one. I'm also gonna be experimenting with some Guterman thread that I have that's got a little bit of metallic fibers in it. That's a good alternative if you are kind of done with the metallics and you find them to be too much of a hassle. You may want to try out something like a Sulky Polystar that has that same like shimmer in it, but also behaves more like a traditional thread. Something I've also found, if you are getting a lot of thread breakages, slow down your stitch speed. I usually keep mine at 350 stitches per minute, which is the slowest. I don't mind taking the extra time because I just want to eliminate as many problems as I can and prevent things like that. And then another thing I would do is go up a needle size. If you're using a 75 over 11, try out the 80 over 12 or the 90 over 14 because the bigger the scarf is in the eye of the needle, like the less like you, you are to get that stripped thread or get thread breakages. So it's just a tip I wanted to pass along about different types of needles and thread. Another thing, pick up extra bobbins. You're gonna need them. You're going to want to pre-wind or you can also buy pre-wound bobbins with thread already on them. I usually get the Brother OEM type. I don't really trust the off brands. I'm sure they're probably fine, but I usually just stick to the brother specific brand for the bobbins. I've got this little case. Normally you don't have to worry about matching the bobbin thread with the upper thread because it's gonna be on the back. Sometimes if I'm doing something like towels, I will try to match the bobbin thread to the towel color so that it blends in and isn't real noticeable. 
You can also match it. A lot of bobbin thread is either white or black. So if you have a darker fabric, you can use the black bobbin thread. If you have a lighter fabric, you can use the white bobbin thread. The only situation where you really need to match your bobbin thread with your upper thread, which is why I have some pre-wound bobbins, is if you're doing freestanding lace, because the back is gonna be visible, you do wanna match up the bobbin thread with the upper thread. But that's one of the few situations that you're going to need to do that. For most stuff you're gonna do, white bobbin thread is fine. I personally have not tried the pre-wound bobbins, but I've heard a lot of people say they really like them and they save a lot of time. You are gonna need to have quite a few bobbins wound though if you are winding them yourself. Because of the stitch density and how many stitches you're doing in embroidery design, you do run through your bobbin thread fairly quickly. For all of you who have reached out and asked, hey Jen, I have this, I'm doing a sweatshirt, what stabilizer needle thread should I use? I would tell you this, you need to experiment and do test stitches. Use either the same fabric or a very similar fabric because you don't want to destroy your good blank with a failed design. And I can tell you from personal experience, you're gonna have failures and you're going to have successes with the embroidery. And I would not trust, especially if you're doing a new design for the first time, or if you're trying to embroider fabric you haven't tried before, you don't want your first attempt to be the good item. I have certainly ruined some items that way and I'm sure you might make those same mistakes. It's okay, we're not gonna get better unless we continue to do and continue to try things. Don't be afraid to use up your materials. So here's a good way for you to use up, say you have old clothes that aren't really in good enough shape to donate. So I have this tank top. This no longer fits me anymore and it's kind of ratty so I don't even think I would donate this. This is a perfect item for you to use for embroidery experimentation. So I will take this tank top, I would cut it up and then use different sections to try out different embroidery designs. So if you have questions about what combination to do, you need to try different things, try different tensions, try different stabilizer, needle, thread, see what works best, test out the design because if you don't do the test stitch out, you're going to be kicking yourself later. I have ruined some things and I've been really bummed. And if you do have some items that don't work out, use those items for future experimentation. There's a lot of area on this tank top. I could probably get at least, I would say, maybe 10 different test stitches out, especially if they're smaller, I can use the four by four hoop, try out different needles, try out different thread and do a few different combinations, see which one you like the best and then go with that combination for the good item. Well, I have tried embroidering quite a few things. There's a lot of projects I have not done. I have not done velvet or silk or real delicate fabrics. So if you don't see it here on the channel, I have not tried it. So I don't know the answer, but that's why you really need to experiment with different types of scenarios and see which one is the best. So as far as testing for tension, I did this recently. I made a snowflake pillow and I was embroidering on pretty heavy canvas. So I used, I believe it was a 90 over 14 cloth embroidery needle. I used the sulky polystar thread and I used cutaway stabilizer in the back, but I was a bit nervous because I had not tried this type of material before and I've not tried that thread before. So it was all new to me. So I took a scrap piece of the canvas, same canvas, hooped it with the stabilizer. And then you don't necessarily have to stitch out the whole design, just enough to give you an idea of whether it's gonna work out or not. And I'll show you this example. I ended up changing the tension three different times through the test stitch out to see See if there was a difference and I'm going to show you shots of the front and the back. I ended up auditioning three different tension settings. I switched it throughout the project. I did a section, switched the tension, did a section, switched the tension again, and then I marked out which section was which tension so I would know later. And then from there I kind of eyeballed which one I liked the best and then for the final real stitch out, I ended up selecting my tension based on the test. So that is just one way you can audition different tension types because a lot of you have also been asking what tension should I have? Again, what needle should I have? And the only way you're really gonna know is if you try them out yourself. Because even if you have pretty similar conditions as I'm using in my project, they're never gonna be exactly the same. That's why it is so important to do that test stitch out and try out a few different combinations so that you're going to be happy with the final result, especially if you're using a blank like a jacket or say a backpack, something that costs 20 to $40, you don't really wanna screw that up. So use cheaper fabric or use, you know, scraps and 
try that out first because if you mess that up, it's not a big deal, but it is probably gonna be a bit of a pain if you end up having to throw away a $30 sweatshirt or something. So be very careful and also know that whenever you are embroidering any item or doing something like that, there's gonna be a little bit of risk of something going wrong. Pre-washing fabric. My general rule is I will pre-wash clothing for sure. I will pre-wash windbreakers, jackets, t-shirts, anything you're gonna be wearing and laundering, I pre-wash those before I embroider them because a lot of these fabrics are going to shrink or get a little bit distorted when you launder them over and over again. And you don't want your embroidery design to get warped because the fabric has changed as well. So say you do a cotton t-shirt you embroider it and then you don't pre-wash it. When you wash it, it will shrink and that is going to make your embroidery design look a little jacked up. Pre-wash anything you plan to wash again. Items I won't usually pre-wash are things like uh, quilt labels, kind of hit or miss. I will use state cutaway stabilizer or some sort of leave-in stabilizer though, just so that the design might not get like puckered or warped. I won't usually pre-wash things like zipper pouches, something that I'm not really planning to wash. So there are some times when I will skip washing the fabric for anything I plan to launder for sure, I will pre-wash blankets, towels, anything like that. Sometimes I'll wash the item twice, use the shout color catcher in the wash because that will keep the fabric dye from bleeding. So shout color catcher is great to have, good for quilting or for washing anything where you don't really want the colors to mix together. If you're here because you're new to machine embroidery, welcome to the club. It's a good one to be in and I've had a lot of fun with it. Definitely check out the video I have with an overview of using the Brother P800 embroidery machine. It's a really solid one, even if you're not really a sewing expert, I find it's still pretty easy to use for beginners. And if you have any tips you feel would be helpful to other beginners, Beginners, let me know below in the comments and I think others would really appreciate the advice too. I'm just one person, I'm sharing what I know, but between us as a community, there's gotta be a wealth of information out there. So let's share with each other and maybe help each other out. That would be great. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Jen with The Sewing Report. I'll see you guys again in the next video.